Hello and welcome to my channel where I'll be telling you all kinds of strange stories ranging from true crime to some much less believable although just as fascinating tales. For today's video we have the sadistic story of Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka, the Ken and Barbie killers. Listen in and see what you think. Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka were the quintessential 1980s power couple, enjoying every advantage and benefit open to them because they were attractive, white and blonde. Behind those dazzling blue eyes, however, there was no humanity. They were much more frightening and psychopathic than anybody could have anticipated. Paul Bernardo was born on the 27th of August 1964 in Scarborough, Ontario, into a chaotic household. Kenneth, his father, was a rapist who abused his own daughter. He also verbally and physically assaulted his wife, Paul's mother. He often referred to her as a bitch and a fat cow, words Paul would later use to describe his own victims. She grew very unhappy and put on a significant amount of weight, ultimately confining herself in the basement of her own home out of fear and hopelessness. Despite this, friends and neighbours remembered Paul as a lovely, cheerful boy with dimpled cheeks and wavy blonde hair. Paul learned at the age of 16 that Kenneth was not his biological father. He despised his family from then on, and particularly his mother, and when he moved out, he cut all ties. Paul Bernardo went on to study at the University of Toronto after graduating high school. It was there that his sadism blossomed and he started to abuse his lovers. In fact, one of his ex-girlfriends reported him to the police many times for abuse, rape and threats against her life, but nothing was done. In 1987, Paul started raping women in the Scarborough region. He would kidnap them from bus stations, violently rape them, often beating, strangling and slashing and piercing them with a knife. He was nicknamed the Scarborough Rapist by the media. Now to Carla. Carla Hamolka was born on the 4th of May, 1970. She was the most beautiful and well-liked of the three girls her parents had. She was raised by kind parents and she aspired to be a vet and began working at a veterinary clinic as a teenager. This is why she was at a pet food convention that was taking place at the same hotel Paul Bernardo happened to be staying at on that fateful day when they met. A meeting that would go on to destroy countless lives. When Paul met Carla in the lobby of that hotel, she was 17 and he was 23. It was lust at first sight for both of them and they slept together that same night. From then on, Bernardo would drive to see Homolka twice a week and slowly came to control her whole life, deciding how she should dress, what she should eat and even what she should believe. Unlike his previous girlfriends, Homolka easily submitted to and even encouraged his sexual behaviour, writing his nasty comments on a self-improvement list. Though it didn't end their relationship, the reveal that Homolka wasn't a virgin when they first met upset Bernardo greatly, and this will come into play later on. Despite this seemingly off-kilter power dynamic within the relationship, Paul and Carla discovered they had the same sadomasochistic impulses and they immediately assumed the roles of master and slave. Their connection, and the violence it involved, became more intense over time. Meanwhile, Paul kept raping women with Carla's knowledge, even her consent. In May 1990, 
One of Paul's victims described her attacker to police who created a facial composite and distributed it to the public. After viewing the drawing, a former colleague of Paul's contacted the police to tell them that he thought the Scarborough rapist looked a lot like his old friend, but the call was not followed up on. Months later, the wife of an old neighbour of Paul's phoned and said the same thing, and there were other calls too. By this time, the police could no longer ignore the fact that so many people had named the same man in connection with the crimes, and they finally found Paul and interrogated him. His good looks and charisma, however, led them to think he was innocent. How could such a charming man be a violent and dangerous rapist? Luckily, however, despite these initial feelings, they did take a DNA sample from him. It was protocol. No one expected it to match the DNA found at the crime scenes, and the truth was it didn't match. Or rather, it didn't match for another two years, which is how long it took for the backlog of DNA tests to be cleared using the unsophisticated technology that was available to the Scarborough Police in the early 1990s. Unfortunately, while the results were being tested, Paul Bernardo took the opportunity to keep doing what he was doing, and that meant the death of at least three girls and the rape and assault of many more. By this time, the fact that Carla hadn't been a virgin when she met Paul was beginning to cause big problems. He just couldn't get past the fact that he hadn't been the one to take it from her. Paul's arrogance caused him to think he deserved to take Carla's virginity, but because he couldn't, Carla, ever the loyal slave, prepared the next best thing. Carla saw Paul staring at her 15-year-old sister, Tammy. He would peek through her window and watch her as she undressed, even filming her at times, all with Carla's knowledge and permission. So, Carla devised a strategy to offer him what he wanted, or as close to it as was possible. Carla would give Paul her little sister's virginity for Christmas. Carla and Paul were at the Homolka home on the 23rd of December 1990. They were living there together by this time, as Carla's family adored Paul, and it would give the young couple the chance to save up for a place of their own. Carla and Paul served Tammy sedative lace drinks during a family Christmas celebration on that day, and when everyone else had gone to bed, the deadly duo took Tammy to the basement. Carla covered Tammy's nose and mouth with a cloth drenched in the anaesthetic halothane, which she had stolen from the vet clinic where she worked. Once the girl was unconscious, the pair started raping her while filming it with the video camera Paul had received as a Christmas present. Tammy, who was severely drugged at the time of the attack, vomited and inhaled it, choking to death. The couple contacted the EMTs after meticulously clearing up the evidence of what they had done. Despite Tammy's huge, inexplicable burns on her face, which came from the halothane, the cops believed the beautiful young couple's story that Tammy had just had too much to drink, passed out and choked on her own vomit. This heinous, insane deed seems to have drawn the two closer together, even as it destroyed the Homolka family as a whole. The pair moved in together soon after Tammy's murder, leaving the scene of the crime and Carla's devastated parents behind them. When they were finally alone in their own private place, Carla would dress up in Tammy's clothing and pretend to be her when she and Paul had sex. But Paul was still not pleased. He blamed Carla for Tammy's death. Of course, he wasn't sad that the poor girl had died, but he was annoyed that he could no longer enjoy her as a plaything, which is what he wanted. Carla wanted to make things up to Paul, so the pair came up with another disgusting plan. They went out and found another toy for Paul, a young teenager known only as Jane Doe. Jane had known Carla from their time working together at the vet clinic, and she admired the lovely older woman. 
Knowing this, Carla invited her to dinner and, exactly like her sister, laced her drinks with sedatives, drove her home and gave her the halothane. Both Paul and Carla violently raped and tortured her, and once again they videotaped it. Unlike Tammy, however, Jane survived. She awoke the following day hurting and queasy, but with no recollection of what had happened to her. Meanwhile, less than six months after Carla's sister's death, the pair, but mainly Paul, was arranging their wedding, a sumptuous event complete with a horse-drawn carriage, an expensive Princess Diana bridal gown, and a sit-down dinner of veal-stuffed pheasant. Surprisingly, Paul boasted to acquaintances that the wedding was a money-making venture, and that he anticipated to receive $50,000 in presents. To show what kind of people they were, instead of Carla adopting Paul's surname or even retaining her own or vice versa, the pair informally called themselves Teal, after the fictitious serial murderer Martin Teal, played by Kevin Bacon in the film Criminal Law. On the 15th of June 1991, only two weeks before their wedding, the pair upped their sick game. Remember, they hadn't intended to murder anybody until now. Tammy's death had been accidental and Paul was furious with Carla for being responsible. However, that was all to change when it came to their next victim, 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey. This time, murder was definitely on their minds. Bernardo met 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey, who had been locked outside her home in punishment for missing her curfew, when he was driving around looking for something to do. After Mahaffey was offered and accepted a cigarette, Bernardo led her to his car where he pulled a knife on her, blindfolded her and drove her home to Carla, telling Hamoka that they had a new playmate. The pair kept her prisoner for many days, raping and torturing her while videotaping everything. When they had had enough of her, they murdered her, dismembered her corpse and sealed the fragments in cement blocks. Carla threw those blocks into nearby Lake Gibson. Two weeks later, on the 29th of June, as the murderous couple was making wedding vows in front of friends and family, fishermen on the lake found the slabs of concrete holding Leslie's legs, feet and head. Another boater found her torso in the sea the following day. Paul and Carla were on their honeymoon in Hawaii when the police began investigating this murder. They must have thought they'd gotten away with it, again, because they just didn't stop. After almost a year, the pair had allegedly kidnapped and raped at least two additional women, both of whom survived. Their third victim as a married couple would not be so lucky. Kristen French was kidnapped from a church car park in April 1992 by the pair. Kristen had no anaesthetic, no blindfold and little chance of survival. They tortured and raped her in the same way they tortured and raped Leslie before murdering her. Horribly, as soon as they were done with Kristen, Carla fled the room so she could fix her hair for Easter dinner with her family. As for Kristen's body, they just dumped it in a ditch. As an aside, Carla may not have had a conscience, but something kept her up at night. Carla went to a psychic following Kristen's murder for guidance on how to expel the sounds she was hearing from the basement where Leslie had been mutilated. Clearly she was feeling at least a little guilty, although not guilty enough to do anything to stop her husband's cruel rampage. It was Paul's venom that would ultimately prove his undoing. Although we don't know the reason, if there even was one, and not that any reason would be enough, Bernardo brutally beat Homolka with a torch on the arms, legs, head and face on the 27th of December 1992. The badly injured Homolka returned to work on the 4th of January 1993, claiming she had been in a car accident. Her suspicious co-workers contacted Homolka's parents, who thought they were rescuing her, by forcibly taking her from the home the next day. Her Molka, however, returned, desperately looking for something. We now know this is likely to be those videotapes. 
her parents brought her to St Catherine's General Hospital where her injuries were recorded and she provided a statement saying that she was an abused spouse and she filed charges against Bernardo. He was detained but freed on his own recognizance. Around this same time, the DNA sample that had been taken from Paul Bernardo so long before finally came back as a match and the Green Ribbon Task Force established in 1992 to investigate the deaths of Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French wanted to interrogate Carla further about Paul and about a Mickey Mouse watch she was wearing that appeared similar to Kristen's. They interrogated her for almost five hours but she didn't say anything yet. She hired a lawyer who presented her as an abuse victim who was compelled to engage in Paul's heinous acts out of fear for her life, and the medical report substantiated this claim, at least at the outset. The authorities proposed a plea bargain in which she would plead guilty to manslaughter and get just 12 years in prison in return for her testimony against Paul. That agreement, dubbed the Pact with the Devil afterwards, was immediately approved. The police investigated Paul's home for 71 days, but were unable to locate the alleged rape tapes. However, Paul had informed his lawyer that the videotapes were concealed in an upstairs bathroom ceiling light. His lawyer discovered the recordings, but did not turn them over as evidence. After more than a year, that lawyer left, and a new lawyer, John Rosen, took his place. Rosen did give over the recordings to authorities, but it was too late. Prosecutors had already struck the notorious plea deal with Carla. When law enforcement viewed the terrible events on the recordings, it was clear that Carla was not the innocent bystander she claimed to be in order to get her plea bargain. Even seasoned detectives and reporters couldn't keep their emotions in check as the transcripts were read aloud in court. Carla was a willing perhaps even enthusiastic, participant. Paul was convicted of numerous crimes, including two first-degree murders and two aggravated sexual assaults in September 1995. He was sentenced to life in prison at Kingston Penitentiary, Canada's most secure maximum security facility, without the possibility of parole for at least 25 years. He was labelled a dangerous offender, making it unlikely he would ever be freed. He was never prosecuted for the Scarborough rapes, which total 19 known victims. There may be many more, some estimate a total of 43 victims. Meanwhile, Carla completed her sentence in July 2005. She remarried and is the mother of three children. In order to remain anonymous, she has used numerous aliases, including Leanne Teal. Her parole terms were relaxed in 2015, and in May 2017, she was outed for helping at a Catholic primary school in Montreal, where her children attended, causing widespread public outcry. The following year, Paul applied for parole and was rejected. The media and the general public are still intrigued by Carla, of course. The question of where is Carla Hamolka now has produced many headlines and various social media groups have been formed to address that exact issue. But why is everyone fascinated with Carla, not so much with Paul, who was at least half of this lethal duo and perhaps the driving force? For one thing, she's out and about so there's a lot of rage and hatred directed towards her. But more importantly, women who murder, particularly when they kill with such brutality and ferocity, are seen as worse than men who do the same, whether this is fair or not. It defies ancient Victorian ideas of feminine nature, which hold that women are incapable of such heinous acts of cruelty. And it is uncommon. Just 15% of serial killers are female, and the majority of them kill quietly and domestically. The rare female serial killers who kill alongside males generally do so because they have a dependent personality disorder. They're weak, they have a profound fear of abandonment, they've been abused, they're often uneducated. Carla does not match any of these descriptions, at least not to the extent that usually 
creates such a terrible killer. She is a mystery, a psychopath and a sexual sadist, a serial killer and rapist who is still at large. Thank you so much for watching my video. If you enjoyed the content, click the subscribe and like buttons so you can receive more content like this strange story every week. See you next time.